welcome you to this fourth Sunday of Advent, a celebration as we wait with anticipation for the birth of Jesus again. We are glad that uh, you have joined us. Uh, lots of activities today we'd like to point out to you. Uh, first of all, following uh, the morning service, uh, we will have the uh, Advent Bible study uh, that we unfortunately had to cancel because of the weather on Wednesday. And we'll do that uh, right after the morning service. Uh, for those who are watching us uh, on uh, Channel 95, that Bible study will only be available on Facebook. Uh, so if you'd like to watch the Bible study, you can turn in on Facebook uh, and, and join us for that. And then this evening, uh, we will have a community service of lessons uh, and carols uh, featuring uh, the community choir, some uh, special music. Uh, we encourage you uh, to join us uh, for that this evening. Uh, it will be broadcast on Facebook as well as Channel 95, uh, but we'd like to see a lot of faces here this evening uh, as we uh, celebrate uh, the good news of the gift of Jesus. Also, uh, this coming week, uh, some of you may be familiar with the Chosen uh, series that is on uh, the internet on some uh, cable channels. It is a uh, series that talks about the life of Jesus. Very, very well done. Uh, a wonderful perspective. Uh, we have been granted the rights to show their Christmas movie. Brand new Christmas movie. It's out in the theaters uh, right now. But they realize for a lot of small towns, small churches, you do not have access to a theater that is showing it. So they have given us the rights to show that. And we're looking at either Wednesday or Thursday, we'll get an announcement out to everyone when we uh, know for sure uh, to invite you to come share in that special uh, family uh, movie tonight. Also, as you uh, look through the bulletin, um, be in prayer for those who especially need God's grace uh, this holiday season, not only for those who are sick, but also for those who are struggling uh, with various things. The holiday tends to magnify and intensify uh, some of our greatest hurts. And add uh, to your prayer list uh, Gord Feenstra and uh, Wilma Vandenhoek uh, as they have had some stays in hospitals uh, this past week. But we have come today uh, to worship. We have come to celebrate God's love. So let's stand as we sing together Angels from the Realm.
we lit were for hope. And peace. Joy. Today we light the fourth candle, the candle of love. With this flame we signify the love of God that always surrounds and fills us, but that we recognize in a special way in the Christmas story. There is no greater power than love. It is stronger than rulers and empires, stronger than grief or despair, stronger than even death. We love because God loves us. Stand to receive the Lord's greeting. Grace, mercy, peace, these are some of the gifts that are given to you this day from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Greet one another in Christian love.
He stepped down into this world to begin to bridge the gap, to heal the divide that man had created in our first and subsequent sins. And at the cross, he completed the transaction and brought us the forgiveness that we so desperately needed. And daily we should remind ourselves of what we have done that caused Christ to come into this world. Mindful of that, join me in this prayer of confession. Almighty God, giver of all good gifts, especially your Son, the Word made flesh, we confess we have neither followed your light nor searched for signs of your love in the world. We have refused your peace and care. We have not trusted your good news to be truly good. We have expected little and hoped for less. Forgive us for doubting and failing to trust you. Renew within us all your strong and noble desires. Help us to hear once more the story of Jesus our Savior and Lord, with transformed lives and renewed hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Rise in joy and hope, for God's promises are sure, and Christ's salvation is at hand. stepfather to your son. In that name Joseph found strength. Mary pondered and wondered and throughout the generations people have come and they have knelt and they have worshipped. We jo join that long progression of shepherd and wise man <coughs> of king and pauper of those of good repute, those who are marginalized by the world, yet all those who have heard the name and have been transformed by the good news that our God saves. Father, this time of the year, it's easy to get caught up in all of the different activities, to be buried beneath the busyness of a of a to-do list and things left yet undone. But Father, may we take time. May we take time to sit and in the stillness ponder that name. Ponder your Son. To think of you, Jesus, who stepped down from the glories of heaven into the grit and grime of our world, who took upon our flesh and blood who endured so much at our hands, even though we did not know what we were doing. 
Father, we lifted your Son high. Jesus, we plunged the nails into your hands and feet. We put a mockery of a crown upon your head. For the babe born in Bethlehem, adored not only by believers, but <coughs> by all who seek peace, found such a violent end at our hands. Yet we praise you today that that is not the end of the story. That your son rose again on that third day. He was the conqueror over the greatest fear that we have. And by releasing us from that fear, you have released us, Jesus, into this world to share the good news that you have come and that you are coming again. And that those dark things in this world must yield to the light of that first star. And the darkness being driven back, lighting the way to a new heaven and a new earth. When there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more struggle. But there will be joy. And there will be peace. And there will be love when all our hopes and dreams are realized. Father, that's what we celebrate by looking back to the manger bed, yet also looking forward, watching the skies, waiting for the sound of the trumpet and the call of victory. Lord Jesus, when you come again, may you find faith on earth. May you find hearts prepared. May you find us Worshipping, eager to worship you forever. <clears throat> Father, we pray for those who are yet to hear the good news. We pray for those who have heard, yet their hearts remain hardened. We pray for those who have heard and have just begun the journey of faith. We pray for those of us who've been on the journey for a while and perhaps have grown weary. Encourage us anew with the story of Christmas. Father, be with all who call to you today from beds of sickness, from bouts of depression, from crippling anxiety, from worry and concern over their daily bread. Father, all of us need to hear the good news again in varying and different ways. Holy Spirit, speak into our lives the words of hope. Shine your joy into joyless spirits. Give to our troubled hearts the peace that passes understanding. And today, especially today, pour your love into our hearts that it might overflow to a world so desperately in need. Father, hear our prayers. We lift them before you, now uniting our hearts and voices in this one prayer, the gift of prayer that Jesus gave when he told all his disciples, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts to hear once again from God's word, O come, O come, Emmanuel.
The Word of God this last Sunday in Advent comes from the most familiar uh, passage in the Gospels, as well as a companion word from that same Apostle, the Apostle John. Hear first these familiar words from John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Later in life, John picks up that same story in the first letter that he writes to the church, 1 John chapter 4, beginning at verse 9. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. May God add his blessing to this his holy and inspired word. One of my favorite uh, Christmas movies of all time uh, is A Christmas Story. I'm sure most of you have, uh, have seen that. Uh, the story of, of young Ralphie, who wants nothing more for Christmas than the Red Rider BB gun. And we kind of follow his, his saga, trying to, first of all, get Santa to, to take note, and then uh, trying to uh, let his parents uh, catch a clue of what, of what he really wants. And then we kind of come to the end of the movie, and Ralphie comes down with great anticipation, and they tear into all of the gifts. Yet, lo and behold, there is no Red Rider BB gun under the tree. It is only a little bit later, when the time is right, that uh, Ralphie's father says, you know, there's one last gift I think I see over there. And, of course, it is the best gift, the gift that Ralphie had so much desired, that Red Rider BB gun. And I was thinking about that this morning, uh, about saving the best gift last. We do it in, in our family, or at least we did it over the years, is we would always take the best gift, at least in the eyes of Jody and I, and we'd hide that away for the very end. We didn't want the boys getting the best gift uh, early and then not caring about the rest. Not that the other gifts were not good, but we thought that this one or this one was the best of all. And so it is with, with God. We have been uh, thinking about re-gifting the gifts that God gives us at Christmas. And this morning, we confess that he has indeed saved for us the best gift. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. Now, we have talked about, about hope. We've talked about peace. We've We've talked about joy, but, but love, God's greatest gift, a gift to re-gift. Bishop uh, Michael uh, Conyer uh, really kind of inspired this series when he wrote uh, a few years ago these words, the gift of Christmas is meant to be re-gifted. The joy and love and peace and spirit of this season are meant to be shared. In fact, when we attempt to hoard Christmas, to recreate the experiences of a previous Christmas, or to isolate ourselves away to have a merry Christmas, that never works. Christmas is always to be regifted. And that has been kind of our focus as we've talked about the gifts of Christmas. We've talked about hope. We talked about the fact that there is a promise for every need. That hope is not wishful thinking, but hope is solid. It is standing firm on the Word of God, and He who has promised will provide in His time. We talked about peace.
God has made peace with us so that we can make peace with our brothers and sisters. And we talked about what it means to be a peacemaker, to be a, a bridge builder, to actively seek, to share, and to receive the forgiveness of God. And last week we talked about joy, that, that, that emotion that rises above circumstance, that gift from on high that, that fills our lives with, with smiles and songs and celebration, that fills our hearts in such a way that it overflows into the lives of others. We were encouraged to re-gift hope and peace and joy. And now today, to re-gift God's love. Well, what is God's love? At Christmas, we find it here again in this perhaps most simple of verses, a consolidation of what the Christmas story is all about. What is the Christmas love of God? First of all, it is a personal love. A personal love. It says, God loved. He gave. He did not delegate his message. He did not say, here is a, uh, a tablet, here is a book, here is a teaching. He did not ultimately send the prophets, the rabbis, the teachers. He knew that ultimately if we were to experience what Christmas love is, he needed to give himself. He needed to get personally involved. Jesus stepped down into this world. And it was a tremendous step. It was more almost a, as, as a fall from the joy, the peace, the hope, the, the worship of heaven into a world that didn't know how to receive him, didn't understand him. A world that returned his love with hatred, his kindness with the cross. Yet he got personally involved. He walked this world. He was tempted as we were tempted. He experienced all that you and I would ever experience through life. And he did so without sin. God came to us because we could not climb our way to him. It was a personal love. It was a love that could touch, a love that could, could, could heal, a love that, that could embrace. So God came, and in his came, he gave himself a personal love. It was a sacrificial love, of course, because what did he give? He gave his one and only son. He gave the best of himself, the best that he could offer this world. Jesus came to exchange his life for yours, his life for mine, to die the death that we could never endure, to pay the price that we could never pay in order that we might be reconciled to God. He was willing to do that for us, to give of himself, even to the bitter and shameful death upon a cross. It was not, you know, merely a, a quick stop to say hello, to, to, to hand out a few trinkets. He came into this world to die. His life for ours, the ultimate sacrifice. Personal love, sacrificial love. It was a transformational love because this love that he gave upon the cross did something. It didn't just engender warm feelings, but John 3.16 says that the love of Christmas is a transformational love. He loved, he gave his one and only that we might have eternal life. That we who were hell-bound, sin-constricted, enemies of God, might be set free from the fear of death might be welcomed into God's forever family. A transformation from darkness to light. A transformation that took out the heart of stone and put in the living heart of flesh that we might dwell eternally with him. A change of status. 
a change of future, a change of everything about us. This is what God's love accomplished. A love that did not merely leave us where we were, but lifted us so that we might be where he is. That's the Christmas love we celebrate. That's the Christmas love we sing about, that God personally got involved in this world, personally got involved in our situations, and he did what had to be done at the cost of his own life to make things right, to make us right, to transform our lives forever. That's what we celebrate. Well, how do we turn that celebration into a, a communion with our brothers and sisters? How do we take this, this gift and re-gift it into the lives of the people that we meet? Well, our passage from John, 1 John chapter 4, again tells us what we need to do. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. That's the commentary on John 3, 16. And why, dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. What is John saying? John's saying we've seen what love looks like in the face of Jesus Christ. Now we need to reflect that same love. We need to, to share that same love. We need to reflect and re-gift that love to one another. That this gift is given in order that it might be given away. And John gives us the model in 3.16 and here in, in John 4. He says, here's what it looks like. Your love should look like God's love. Which means, first of all, that it needs to be a, a personal love. If we are to share the good news of God's love, we need to, like Jesus, incarnate, put some flesh on the love of Jesus came into this world assuming our flesh and blood so that he might show the love of God. If we are to show the love of God, we must reflect, incarnate, if you will, the character of Jesus. To show to one another the love that he showed. Uh, John 1.14, the world became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the personification of love. And then echoed in 1 John 2, verses 5 and 6. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. If you want to know if you are in Christ, here's the answer. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus walked. We show the same type of involvement that Jesus showed when he was in this world. He did not isolate himself from sinners. He did not gather in a holy huddle with those who were the righteous, at least in their own eyes. He walked among the lowliest of the low. He spent his ministry along the margins of society. He brought good news to, to people who had heard nothing but, but bad news, and he got personally involved. In a culture that says, do not touch the unclean, he embraced them. In a culture that says, turn away, he ran toward. And so it ought to be for you and I. The Christian life cannot be lived at a distance as much as we like it that way. It would be much easier to, to write a check and to send it off than to actually get involved. But that's what we are called uh, to do, to incarnate the personal love of God. It was so exciting over you know, the fall to watch the, the group that gathered to, to go to the banquet. 
Now there were some that had, had gone in the past and, and, and they were used to the press of the flesh. They were used to the, to the, to the interaction uh, with those who were kind of on the fringes of society. But it was interesting to watch the new people, to watch the, the young people. You know, at first they were, there's no way I can do this. There's no way that I can even hand out salt or, or pepper or creamer. But as the night progressed, they got involved. And to sit and to have an opportunity to, to talk and to hear people's story. To actually hold someone's hand in prayer. I mean, it was eye-opening for some of these, these young people, some of these older people as well. But that's what it means to incarnate the personal love of God. It means you get right down there with them. You hear their story. You share their story. And you come alongside of them to help to heal, to help them hear the good news of God. Look, you, you show it. You walk like Jesus did. You go to the places where Jesus went. The Christian life is a messy one. The Christian faith is, is down and dirty. You have to push up your sleeves. And you have to get down where people are because that's exactly what God did. And to say, well, I, I can't with these people in this place. Remember how far Jesus came to be with us. It needs to be a personal incarnation. Secondly, if we are to re-gift the love of, of God at Christmas, it needs to be a sacrificial love. 1 John 3.16, the parallel so John 3.16 says this, This is how we know what love is. What's this love look like? Jesus laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? The love that we show has to be sacrificial, as Christ was sacrificial, to lay down even our lives itself for the needs of our brothers and sisters. We rejoice that the missionaries down in Haiti uh, were set free. But I was thinking about another uh, group of missionaries right about the same time of year, perhaps to us the most famous uh, martyrs of the modern age, Jim Elliot and his companions. And we know the story, I hope, of, of Jim Elliot uh, and these uh, men and uh, wives who went along. They wanted to reach out to this isolated tribe. They wanted to incarnate uh, the love of, of God to be personally involved. And it was right about this time of year, right about the Christmas time, in light of the Christmas story of God coming into the world, that, that Elliot and his friends made the decision that they were going to fly into that area. And they were going to try to share the love of Jesus with the Aka Indians. And they said, you know, we need to do what Christ did. We need to go and to show his love. They didn't realize, of course, that it was going to be a sacrificial love. Although, of course, Jim Elliot, in his famous quote talks about, you know, giving your life something you cannot hold on to. You know, why should you be afraid to, uh, uh, to give it away? But it was that Christmas decision that brought them to that beach just a, uh, a few uh, weeks from Christmas Day where they were killed by those very same Indians that they wanted to share the love of Jesus Christ with. But the story doesn't end with their death. Their wives, their families went back and ministered among the very ones that took the lives of their husbands and fathers. And they were willing to keep sacrificing even though they had given up so much already. We are called to sacrifice. Maybe not something as extreme as, as that of Jim Elliot and and those involved with him. But we are to ask the question, well, what is my one and only? What is that one thing that, that I hold on to that is precious as life to me? Maybe it's your family. 
You know, maybe it's your career, maybe it's your possession. What is your one and only? Then ask yourselves, if God was willing to give up his one and only son, what should I be willing to give up for him? Someone says, you know, it's tragic that, you know, we celebrate the love of, of God at Christmas, and then when he asks for our love, we give him nothing but the Christmas leftovers. Love ought to cost us something of our time, our talent, our, uh, our treasure. What is the one and only, perhaps, that God is calling you to sacrifice so that others might know his love? That's one of the key questions of those who re-gift the love of God. What does God expect of me? What does God want from me? personal love that gets involved, a, a sacrificial love that is willing to, to give up the one and only so that people might meet God's one and only Son. And thirdly, if we are to re-gift the love of Christmas, it needs to be a transformational gift of love. 1 John 3, 18, Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in the truth. Love changes Personal, sacrificial love changes people. I was just reading this morning in a, uh, in a devotion about a, a couple that had gotten married young. She was 17, he was, was 19. It was that classic small town uh, love story. And they had some wonderful early years together. They, they had children. But then one day, about eight, nine years into the marriage, the wife is standing doing dishes at the sink, and something happened. She took off her apron, put it on the counter, and left. And of course, the husband was frantic. You know, where is, is my wife? The children were frantic. What is going on? A few days later, she called. And the husband trying to fight back the anger, trying to you know, deal with the worry and the stress, you know, says, where are you? Why aren't you with us? Come home. I miss you. The children miss you. Where are you? And she hung up the phone. And over the next weeks and months, she would call back. And the husband would say, I love you. Please come home. Where are you? And she'd hang up the phone every time he asked where she was. Finally, in, in desperation, he he took the family savings and he hired a private detective. And the private detective found this young woman in, of all places, Des Moines, Iowa, and told the husband, I found your wife. He borrowed money from his family, from his wife's family, and he bought a plane ticket to fly cross country to Des Moines, Iowa. And he came to a location where his wife was staying, and it was a run-down flop house in Des Moines, Iowa. And he climbed up the stairs, because you don't have an elevator in a flop house like that. And he kind of steeled his heart. He was ready to make his pitch to his wife, and he pounds on the door. And she opens the door. And as soon as he, 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 he saw her, he couldn't remember anything he wanted to say. All he could say is, I love you, and I want you to come. It's as she fell into his arms. She melted in his arms. And she came home. A few months later, they're sitting in front of the fire right around the Christmas time, and the kids were in bed. He goes, I have to ask you, for months and months, I said I loved you and I asked you to come home, yet you never came home. What made the difference? And she looked at him and simply said, all those other times, you said you loved me. But this time, you came. And that's what transformed this woman. That's what transformed that marriage. Is a love that was willing to be personal, <coughs> sacrificial, and transformational. We love not merely to, to help people who are struggling. 
We love not merely so they can have a little food on the table or clothes on their back or a roof over their head. If we are truly loving with the love of Christ, we want their lives to change. Not merely materially or emotionally, but, but spiritually. Over in 1 Peter 4, 8, it says this, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. What's Peter saying? He says that love is so powerful that there is nothing that love cannot change. There is no sin, there is no burden, there is no heartache, there is no separation, there is no gulf that love cannot transform. And that really is the test. Not to love with words, but to love with actions. To love in such a way that people's lives are changed. Love changes people. Love changes lives. And that's the kind of love that we ought to have as followers of Jesus Christ. That's the kind of love we ought to share those who have experienced the Christmas love of God who gave his one and only son so that we might have eternal life. We need to come. And we need to sacrifice and we need to pray that that love of God transforms. What a wonderful gift God has saved for last. What a wonderful gift we have an opportunity to share. Norman Brooks has our last word this morning. He writes, Christmas is forever, not for just one day. For loving, sharing, giving are not to put away, like bells and lights and tinsels in some box upon a shelf. The good you do for others is good you do yourself. Let's pray. Father, we want to do good. We want good for others. But that is a love that we need to do ourselves. Not in our own strength, not in our own resources, not so that we would get the pat on the back or the words of gratitude, but we do so in your strength. Sharing not human love, which waxes and wanes, but sharing your love, which is forever and forever can change. Father, help us as we continue this journey to the manger bed. To remember that Christmas is for every day. The gifts of Christmas are for every day. May we hold out hope. May we practice peace. May the joy within us shine in the lives of those around us. And may the love that we know be the love that we give away. We pray this in your name, Jesus. The greatest gift of love. To close, I invite you uh, to sing, Love Has Come.
behalf of both congregations, I'd like to extend our appreciation with this Christmas gift to Pastor Scott and his family for all that you do in the church and in our community. We are so blessed to have you, and we thank you very much. Let's give them a hand. Thank you on behalf uh, of the family. Uh, we do appreciate uh, being here uh, with you. For me, the second time go around for the, the Jersey contingent. Uh, you know, the first time, it's been a wonderful time uh, coming into the community, uh, sharing together uh, with the churches. And as you'll find, I often just talk about the church because I so much see uh, you guys as, as one body. As, uh, as one family, so we are grateful uh, for the gift and we are more grateful uh, to be among you, especially at this time of the year. Speaking of gratitude, uh, we invite the deacons uh, to come and receive our morning offering. Father, we thank you for the gifts of Christmas, for the hope and the peace and the joy and the love. Father, we know that those things are not material. Yet in the gifts that we bring, that good news can be shared. Those gifts can be explained and opened in people's lives. So Father, take that which we offer today. Bless it by the Spirit. Multiply its grace that many lives may be touched not only now at Christmas, but throughout the coming year. We offer them to you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
excited to stay for the uh, Advent uh, Bible study. Uh, for those who are watching on Facebook, uh, we're going to be logging off of the worship service and then logging back on uh, in a little bit uh, for the Bible study, uh, so you can stick around uh, for that. Now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you now and forever his peace.